Sadly, this is kind of being institutionalized now because kids are learning this. And, and I know, Isabel, you do a lot of work in this space and talked about, you know, your experience in a college campus as a conservative. But there just seems to be this pollution of minds that all they want children to think about is race. And before, uh, earlier today, I actually had a friend reach out to me. Her daughter attends a boarding school in Connecticut. And after the, the trial verdict was read, this is what they sent out to all of the kids. I actually could not even believe. Um, and I'm not going to obviously read this in, entire um, letter. But it says, for many, the state of Minnesota versus Derek Michael Chauvin has been a stark, heart-wrenching reminder of the suffering one human being can inflict on another. It has also been a painful reminder that racism still permeates and threatens the everyday lives of marginalized, marginalized groups in this country. Can one of you guys help me? What was the element of the Derek Chauvin trial that was proven to be about race? Still have yet to answer that question, One piece to be of honest. proof? But you're right, critical race theory is the cancer of education that's now effectively indoctrinating this entire generation of young Americans that are now going to grow up and take that beyond school, so beyond elementary school, beyond middle school and high school and their college campuses, into whatever realm of American society they work in, the halls of Congress, a corporate boardroom, America's streets. Critical race theory is a way of thinking and teaching about America's past and present by looking at the role of systemic racism what we've just been discussing. But the very term itself, critical race theory, has become a political flashpoint across the country, especially when it comes to how to teach young people about justice and equity in America. As Amna Nawaz reports for our Race Matters series, the debate over its potential role in school curricula has set off a firestorm that has roiled school districts and state legislatures nationwide. Next year, Jameson Maddox will be a senior here in Loudoun County, Virginia. His favorite subject is history, even though he felt black history was lacking. I think there could be some things uh, happening in history that should have been taught. In school, do you, did you learn about the Tulsa massacre? No. The infamous massacre that took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, one century ago, holds important lessons for us today as we hear from New York Times columnist Charles Blow. 100 years ago today in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a black teenage shoe shiner named Dick Rowland stepped onto an elevator being operated by a 17-year-old white girl. Wild allegations about what happened on that elevator between the two teens would lead to one of the most notorious massacres in American history. Roland was arrested the next morning, and the Tulsa Tribune printed an incendiary article claiming that the young man had attempted to assault the girl. A white mob descended on the courthouse, demanding that Roland be turned over to them. Armed black men showed up to defend Roland and prevent him from being lynched. Gunfire soon erupted. It would lead to what would become known as the Tulsa Massacre as white people began to shoot black people on sight. Did you learn about Juneteenth? No. What is Juneteenth? Juneteenth is the oldest known celebration commemorating the ending of slavery in the United States. President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation freeing enslaved Africans in the United States in 1862 and the 13th Amendment passed Congress, officially abolishing the institution of slavery in 1863. But it would take years for word to spread. Do you feel like those are things that should be taught as yeah, part of your formal yes, education? Yes, definitely, definitely. But, Jameson's uh, mother, yeah. Vanessa, agrees. Uh, this is American history. All of it should be taught in a certain context and also age appropriate. Last year, as the National Racial Reckoning resonated here, Vanessa joined a Facebook group pushing what they see as anti-racism efforts in school. When I saw the anti-racist parent group, I'm like, OK, I got to be in that. What spurred you to join that group in the first place? What has that been like? There is a definite need for a group like this. I like to be surrounded by like-minded, fair-minded, equitable people. You don't have to think like me, you don't have to be like me, but you do have to be anti-racist. Not everyone in Loudoun County sees it that way. I mean, there were parents that were just sick of it. 
They were just sick of, you know, constantly being told, if you don't agree with me, then, you know, you're a racist. Ian Pryor's two daughters are in elementary school here. He's a former Trump administration Justice Department spokesman, now leading a group called Fight for Schools, a political action committee pushing back on equity and inclusion measures. We're not about not teaching history. We're about teaching history in an objective way that is not represented as America is systemically racist. When you're looking not at individual acts of racism, but the systemic racism that exists within America's educational institutions, what would you suggest be done right now? So there's a balancing act here of making sure that you know, there's equal opportunity for all, that we're committed to meritocracy, but also that you know, when we are trying to, to figure out how to deal with any kind of social problems, we do not overstep and overreact. Now, here's two slides right here. Parents who agree with Pryor are now part of a growing chorus opposing what's known as critical race theory, or CRT, often a graduate level framework that examines how the legacy of slavery and segregation in America is embedded in legal systems and policies. Critical race theory has its roots in cultural Marxism. It should have no place in our schools. I will do everything I possibly can to fight to the bitter end until you prove to me that you are not teaching my children that they are racist just because they're white. That outrage echoes messaging ricocheting across right-wing media. Critical race theory is racist. I don't see critical theory, race theory, in our Declaration of Independence. Much of this can be traced back to a September 2020 directive by then-President Trump, instructing agencies to identify and halt funding of anti-bias training for federal employees that suggests, quote, the United States is an inherently racist or evil country. On his first day in office, President Biden used an executive order to revoke the Trump administration's action. You're in a conversation and someone asks, should Christians support Black Lives Matter? What would you say? It is absolutely true that Black Lives Matter. Christians believe that because all people are made in the image of God, everyone has dignity and equal value. And it's important to affirm that truth for specific groups who feel their value and dignity have not been recognized or have even been denied. However, we need to distinguish between the truth of the phrase Black Lives Matter and the organization that goes by the same name. Some say Black Lives Matter is merely a concept, but when a concept is used to identify a well-funded group with a published manifesto, the group must be evaluated on its own terms. The Black Lives Matter movement is made up of leadership from two main umbrella organizations, the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation and the Movement for Black Lives, or M4BL. They claim to fight for racial justice and human rights. However, that doesn't mean their claims are true or that their solutions are morally right. The church should be leading on issues of justice, operating from a solid foundation of truth and love, instead of merely following movements with broken worldviews. For instance, Christians should champion women's rights, but should never support abortion. Christians should care about the poor, but that doesn't mean supporting the Communist Party. In the same way, Christians should promote racial justice, but we should carefully evaluate organizations before endorsing them. The next time someone says Christians should support Black Lives Matter, here are three things to remember. Number one, the Black Lives Matter movement is all about black power. The movement's self-identifying Marxist founders clearly state on their website, it became clear that we needed to continue organizing and building black power across the country. Martin Luther King Jr. rejected black nationalism and the black power movement of the 60s saying, let us be dissatisfied until that day when nobody will shout white power, when nobody will shout black power, but everybody will talk about God's power and human power. Christians know that the identity humans have is that they are made in the image of God, an identity fully realized in Christ. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Number two, the Black Lives Matter movement is radically pro-abortion. We are working for a world where black lives are no longer systematically targeted for demise. These words are from blacklivesmatter.com but contradict their support of an industry that systematically and disproportionately targets black lives for demise nearly 1,000 times a day. BLM has declared that abortion is a human right. Christians can never support a cause that believes in destroying innocent lives made in the image of God. 
Nationwide, abortion rates in black communities are 3.4 times higher than the majority population, according to the CDC. In New York City, the home of Planned Parenthood, more black babies have been aborted than born alive for years. This is not racial justice. Planned Parenthood alone kills an estimated 360 black lives every day. Yet BLM stands with this organization that is the epitome of the white supremacy they demand must be dismantled. The solution to suffering and inequality is not elimination, it's elevation. Number three, the Black Lives Matter movement is fundamentally dishonest. There can be no justice without truth. Psalm 89, 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Faithful love and truth go before you. In our pursuit of what is morally right, we cannot embrace moral wrongs. We must demand justice for anyone wrongfully killed, regardless of hue, gender, or any other characteristic. But the policy aims of the BLM organization include defunding the police and abolishing prisons. However, the statistics do not support an epidemic of black lives being killed by police. In 2019, there were a total of 999 human beings killed by fatal force by our law enforcement. Of those deaths, 405 were white individuals, 249 were black, 145 were Hispanic, and 182 more individuals were categorized as other or unknown. A shocking 84% of these individuals were armed with a deadly weapon. Context and truth matter. We cannot achieve justice without them. Acting compassionately requires that we separate fact from fiction. So the next time you're talking about racial justice and someone says Christians should support Black Lives Matter, remember these three things. Number one, the Black Lives Matter movement is all about black power. Number two, the Black Lives Matter movement is radically pro-abortion. And number three, the Black Lives Matter movement is fundamentally dishonest. For What Would You Say? I'm Ryan Bomberger. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. What are they? Sentient programs. They can move in and out of any software still hardwired to their system. That means that anyone we haven't unplugged is potentially an agent. Inside the matrix, they are everyone and they are no one.